Primary science should be taught as a science lesson. It should begin with the science phenomena. And I'm always very keen that children connect with their other experiences. So the literacy, the maths, the history, the art, all of that stuff is crucial and the benefit of being in a primary school, why I'm a primary teacher, because you don't teach it in isolation, you teach it within a context that makes sense to the children, but it's a science lesson, so the science should be at the core of it and you should start with the science phenomena and I, I really believe this, it's not about starting with a, a learning tension which you copy off the board and you, you know, you've done 10 minutes before you know what it is, this is about, wow, why did that happen? Or goodness me, I wonder if, and oh, I've just noticed that. It's about really putting the science at the heart of it, the phenomena, what it is we want children to engage with. It's about putting it in a context which makes sense. So if we're seeing, I don't know, how, how we insulate liquids, then it's in a sensible context, like my cup of tea going cold when I'm on playground duty, or, um, or it's not about just a Coke can with cotton wool around it for the sake of it. It's about purposeful actually I know what I'm doing I know what I want to find out and I'll know when I get there so I think those things are crucial to science I think it should be outdoors as much as possible I really truly believe not just the stuff about nature but all of this there's so much more space outside for children to be able to explore so I think going outdoors is crucial to science forces lessons can be outside just actually if we're learning about how things move then we need outdoor space to do that so a lot of outdoors I think there's always a, a tension about practical work. I think practical work involves, is anything that involves children using their hands and their minds. It's not practical work for the sake of it. It's practical work that engages their brains as well. So they're actually thinking and doing. And Ofsted tell us again and again and again that the schools that have the best science are, where is, are the schools where inquiry is at the heart, where we're using the inquiry process to drive and the science learning that children are learning through asking questions, seeking evidence and using the evidence to answer questions. A good science lesson should be challenging. We shouldn't be finding out something that we already knew. And if children come to that lesson with some prior knowledge, which of course they do because they live in the world, then we should make sure as teachers that the lesson offers a level of challenge for them, that they're going to find out something a bit more, or they're going to think about the question in a different way, or it's going to take them a bit further or a bit broader. So it must be challenging. There should be a moment in a science lesson where you think, God, I didn't know that before, I know that now. That has to be built in. I think we have to have opportunities in a lesson for children to be able to summarise what it is they've learnt. So not writing a great long report, that's not what Ofsted want to see, that's really not very good practice. The, pra the good practice is actually, can I summarise what I've learnt now? So giving children opportunities to summarise their learning and express it clearly, that's crucial. I think we need to be quite creative with subject knowledge and encourage children to do that, but we also need to be effective. So it's about teachers understanding what the big ideas are, understanding how those big ideas build up, recognising children's misconceptions and being able to bring them to the fore and address them. That also means that we need to have an environment where science is learnt, where children are confident to be able to express their ideas and aren't frightened of getting it wrong. So that, that's key. And as I said, it's all those opportunities for sharing, for actually teach children sharing their ideas, sharing them with the teachers, teachers giving feedback that really moves children on. So I think those are key elements to a good science lesson. Children do enjoy science in school. If you talk to children, very often science is the favourite subject. I think sometimes it's the favourite subject because it's not English or maths and it's taught in a much, it's different, it's that it's practical to a large extent, it's engaging with ideas, I, I, children like it when they know they've understood something, when they've learnt something, when they've proven something, they like that whole rather satisfying the bit in the old national curriculum that used to say that it satisfies curiosity with knowledge, children find that very satisfying and a good science lesson does that. They like that the fact there's other ways of recording it, that it's that you can find ways of expressing your understanding in a way that isn't always writing about it, and children like that very, very much. 
we find often that children say they don't like science when there's too much writing or there's too much teacher talk. What children like is when they're getting on with it for themselves and finding things out. Science inquiry is what children do in order to answer scientific questions about the world around them. And that's a really useful definition because the key word in it is do to answer questions. So it's actually an active an active process of coming up with a question or being given a question and looking for a way to answer it. And a lot of work has gone into this to identify the ways that children do this in a primary classroom. And actually, they're the ways that people carry on and do it all the way through, right through PhDs and research. There's five main ways that children can answer scientific questions or do science inquiry. So observing over time, actually looking at how things change over time, not intervening, just observing and working out how often we observe, what observations we make, what measurements we make. So how the apple tree changes over the year, how the ice cube melts on the table, how the chicks change as they hatch and grow. That sort of observation over time. Then there's identifying and classifying, the sort of thing that underpins really, if you think about it, most chemistry and biology certainly. How are things the same? How are they different? So from your young children sorting things by whether it's a it's round or whether it's square, whether it's soft or whether it's hard, to real detailed classification where we might be testing, so actually carrying out a test to see which of these materials conduct electricity, which are, which are the, um, the densest, that sort of where we're testing to be able to classify. So identification, what is it, how is it the same as something else, how is it different, that's a key way of answering a scientific question. Then there's the sort of tests we do where we're looking for a relationship between two sets of data. That sounds quite highfalutin, really. What we're all talking about is, do daisies grow most in the middle of the field or at the edge of the field? Do the children with the longest legs jump the furthest or not? We can't, we can't control those sets of data. The data is there and we have to look for a relationship between it. And that's what we're encouraging children to do. Can they see a pattern? And actually, the, there's a real purpose to this because it's those patterns that then might suggest cause and effect which can be tested further. But looking for patterns is a key way that children can answer questions. Fair testing, where we think that, we, that something's having an effect on something else, so we control all the other variables. For example, how does uh, changing the height of the ramp affect how far the car travels? We make sure that we use the same car and the same surface and we're just changing the height of the ramp to see the difference it makes. So fair testing. And then there's the questions that children can't answer practically. They can't actually physically go out and collect the data. They can't um, make the observation first hand. So they're using other data from secondary sources. And in the primary classroom, that doesn't mean always going to a book or to the internet. It may mean talking to an expert. It may mean uh, finding a useful source of information that can answer that question. It may mean using somebody else's data, but it's research using secondary sources. So all of those five types of inquiry make up working scientifically, and that's how it's identified within the new programme of study.